why is Webflow better than WordPress? Why should people be thinking about Webflow to build their websites instead of WordPress? Yeah, so I actually, I mean, I was really a kid at that time, kind of when you started using WordPress actually, but I feel like Webflow is probably kind of the game changing tool as WordPress was, at, let's you said 2008. Welcome back to episode 103 of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Uros Mikis. I hope I didn't destroy that. Uros is the founder and CEO. I'm assuming you're CEO. Yes. Okay. You're the founder and CEO of Flow Ninja, an end to end web flow agency based in Nice, Serbia. So far, they have built over 100 websites for clients like Upwork, Clara, the Berlin Museum, and Engine. When he's not working on this company, he's a teacher and a leader in the first no-code community in the Balkan region. I'm really excited to be talking about Webflow because my team started talking about it. We currently have a WordPress uh, website. I honestly don't really know much about Webflow, which is one of the reasons why I brought you on. I'm very curious about it, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that are curious about it, and I'm sure that probably most people haven't even heard of it. So uh, hopefully this is a very interesting conversation for everybody, and why don't you tell everyone a little about yourself beyond the intro I've just provided, and then we'll move on from there. Yeah, thank you for the invitation scene. So yeah, I basically started in Webflow around six years ago. I was in your shoes like around six years ago working in WordPress. So at that time I was trying to find a perfect solution for kind of my agency, for the build, for building websites, et cetera, et cetera. And then I tried WordPress. I mean, initially the problem that I had with WordPress is that it was really oriented with plugins. Like you probably know kind of anything you want to do in WordPress, you're going to require a plugin to pay for or whatever. Like it wasn't secure, like security breaches were happening often. Like it was updating, then the plugins weren't uh, kind of being updated as frequently as WordPress. So you're scared to press the update button on your website and you're just kind of praying there, this works, don't touch anything on it. And kind of when, when there's a better time, we're going to be updating the website. So that's where I started to go kind of platform by platform. I use Wix, I use Squarespace, I use Shopify, and none of them actually kind of gave me what I wanted until I discovered Webflow and then basically realized that this is technically front-end development kind of for 2022 right now, but at that one time without 2016 or whatever, just because it gave me everything front, a front-end developer can do to me in like 10 times the amount of time, 10 times the last time that uh, it took for front-end development in the end. I'm definitely aware of needing to deal with plugins for WordPress, not knowing which plugins you can trust, not knowing which ones will break your entire website if you update them. Like that's a complete mess. I am so tired of it. I've actually, I started using WordPress, I think in 2008, 2009, I may have been like one of the early adopters of it. Cause before that I was using live journal for uh, my blogging about travel and things before I moved to Asia. So that was like 2005, 2006. WordPress was incredible. It was like this huge sea change of how you develop things or how you design websites. And so how, how can someone understand the difference? It's just like a, a very, very basic level. Like why is Webflow better than WordPress? Why should people be thinking about Webflow to build their websites instead of WordPress? Yeah, so I actually, I mean, I was really a kid at that time, kind of when you started using WordPress, actually. But I feel like Webflow is probably kind of the game changing tool as WordPress was, at, let's you say, 2008, uh, because you're going to have the possibility to build everything on your own terms. So instead of like, let's comparing it to a, a pop up, instead of kind of buying a plugin for a pop up, you're going to be architecting how the pop up looks, when does it appear, uh, at which time, kind of do you want to add cookies or custom code for that? Um, then in terms of any other plugins, basically you're going to be able to either write custom code or develop everything in Webflow pretty easily, kind of with zero code, uh, kind of possible. Then on the other side, you're going to have the, the most quality code possible that Webflow is going to be pushing out. So kind of, you're not going to be worried about speed, lighthouse tests, kind of SEO and all of those, uh, kind of parts that are pretty important for the website. As in uh, kind of WordPress for any specific SEO, you're going to require Yoast SEO or kind of additional plugins for that. Whereas in Webflow, all of that is going to be integrated. And then kind of with just kind of building the website on your own terms, kind of the more benefits coming with Webflow are its own CMS. Because uh, in WordPress, com for comparison, the CMS is, I feel, pretty clunky. 
you're always going to creating either a blog post or a version of a blog post or something like that. And then if you want something more complex, you're going to end up with a headless setup where CMS is uh, in WordPress and you have a headless setup um, somewhere else. Versus in Webflow is going to allow you to create a really kind of unique CMS where you can build 300, 400, 500 landing pages or kind of category pages or things much more advanced than a blog. Uh, with a click of a button. So can I, there's not going to be any coding involved or anything. And the best thing is specifically as we're working with enterprises, you're going to be able to remove the development from that completely. So our role at Flow Ninja is usually we develop the website fully in 80 to 90% of cases. Clients are not going to require to maintain that website later on. And then you as a founder can continue adding new features to it pretty easily. You can create new pages from existing components pretty easily or create CMS pages. Or like if you're an enterprise, you're going to just give it to the marketing team and they're going to have a lot of fun. And basically, I like to say it switch their websites to real time marketing. Instead of thinking the next quarter, we're going to be planning a marketing sprint, kind of you can go day in and day out and just kind of adjust your ad types and adjust the landing pages you're showing to your customers. So I'm definitely going to show this to my marketing director after we're done, before <laughs> anything is edited, just because, like I said, we're using WordPress and I can feel that pain already, just the way you're talking about it. Because I know if we want to add a new page, it'll take us four days to think of the content and, and hammer out any of the issues with the content. Then it takes another three or four days for the designer to design the content. Then it takes another three or four days for the developer to develop the content, you know, to develop the page, you know, and add the content. And then it takes a f at least a few more days to fix all of the bugs on mobile and the web version so that we can push it out. So it's like weeks almost of work just to get a page out. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what most of our clients are having problems with. Kind I feel like we have a, a bunch of clients kind of coming from WordPress to Webflow. At the moment, there's around 40, 42% of websites on the world on WordPress and just 0.5% on Webflow. So market is going to really, really huge. And I feel like we haven't had a client coming from WordPress to Webflow that they were kind of missing WordPress in the end. Everybody was super happy to move from a platform and just to have something sturdy. Uh, I mean, one more thing in terms of kind of security is Webflow is going to be a whole all in one package. So they have 99% uptime. So you're not going to worry about like in WordPress, which template you're going to buy to start the website. Is that good? Which hosting you're going to use? Is that hosting good? Is it going to have uptime, downtime? How are you going to secure the hosting? How are you going to secure the website, et cetera, et cetera. On Webflow, they're all in one. So they kind of give you the tool to kind of create the website, give you the tool for the editor, for the marketeers to edit the content and then provide hosting and security, SSL certificate, a global CDN and everything like that. So basically you're just compiling all of the softwares you previously used into one platform and then moving on from there. So is it painful to switch from WordPress? to Webflow? What, what, what kind of issues are there? Is there like a straight up migration tool or do you have to basically start a website from scratch? Yeah, so that's the biggest pain and maybe the biggest cost uh, kind of cost kind of downside that there is because you're going to have to develop the website from the from the ground up. If you like, there are maybe some tools that are kind of transitioning from WordPress to Webflow, whatever, but none of them are going to give you great re results and are actually going to give you the, all of the benefits Webflow has. So usually it's either clients have a Figma file or we just copy the website over from WordPress by looking at it, kind of build it page by page from the ground up in Webflow. And that's one of the biggest kind of costs that there is. And then afterwards, kind of you can enjoy kind of the fruits of your labors on that front. Uh, in terms of problems, there are many problems like you can uh, you can encounter, like because WordPress is a much older platform. So like how much good the Webflow is because it doesn't have plugins, that, that can be a downside sometimes because instead of paying for a plugin five bucks a month, you're going to probably be the, developing with JS and APIs and kind of everything on the back end uh, to integrate something uh, kind of to Webflow to work as it was working in WordPress with just a few clicks. That can be one of the downsides. 
Then in terms of SEO, uh, I mean, when you're writing schema and stuff like that, you're doing that manually. So there is not a plugin that you just kind of say, I want this, this, and this to, to be running Webflow and kind of it migrates it over into your, into your website. You have to write everything in the head, which can become boring with times. And then you can make mistakes on that front. So that's not uh, nicely integrated. And then in, if you're creating some CMS pages, uh, kind of, you can have only one folder structure versus on WordPress, you will be able to have uh, basically a category, then a post, then maybe another category, then another category, and then that can go pretty deep. That's uh, been kind of where we add, start adding redirects and many other things to kind of avoid that problem. I can see why Webflow is taking some time to blow up because yeah. I think, for example, that folder structure is really important to us in, in what we're doing and having to basically start over. I mean, we're our website's at a point where we don't have that many pages, maybe 10 or 12. But once we raise more money and we launch properly and we're doing real marketing, we're going to get dozens and dozens and dozens, you know, potentially hundreds of pages at some point, I'm sure, because every single feature needs to have its own page. And every section of the application needs to be marketed. So there's a lot of and then and, and there's blog posts and, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different things. So you can get quite complicated building a large company website, um, or having to make that switch over. What is the time frame for like doing all of this? For example, let's say you yeah, have a, so. let's say you have ten pages and you want to switch over, um, and let's assume you have Figma files that you can work with, which we do. How long does it take on, uh, on um, how long does it take on average? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So based on that, I mean, it can take from three to six weeks. I mean, sometimes up to three months, depending on how kind of how large the feature set is for the website. But let's say the most basic websites you can develop and QA it properly like an agency, like in-house in just three weeks for, let's say, 10 pages. And that's where the most of the, of, of the speed of Webflow is, is coming from. And, and that's kind of honestly my biggest problems with the agency, uh, because with WordPress, you had long development times, you had maintenance, and then you can kind of scale the agency pretty easily. Whereas we are here kind of just on a runway, like the longest client is around three to six months. Like that's, that's, that's the longest client amount. And then you're just kind of crushing out items, uh, which is fun for developers and designers because they can always build something new and just kind of get stuck into the repetitive process. But then in the end, it's a little bit scary just because you don't have a lot of secure cash flow in the end. Yeah, that, that definitely can be an issue. I mean, obviously you want to serve your clients to the best of your ability and you don't want to keep them on longer than you need. But if you help them so quickly that you like need to then go look for more clients, is there, and I'm just playing kind of coach here. Is there no way to keep people on a monthly retainer once the initial project is done to like, just be their developers for the website to be like, Hey, you want to add more yeah. pages? Sure. Give us the content and give us the design. We'll put it together. No problem. So like you can basically you, you allow them to outsource their website stuff to you so that they can focus on just doing the actual marketing. Yeah. Yeah, there is. I mean, just the problem. I mean, that's how we positioned ourselves is like us working with enterprises. That's where most of our kind of retainers in the agency come from. Just because we have a specific team for an enterprise and they're working anything web related, web design and web development and kind of building that end to end structure on that front. So there is, but a client needs to be much larger the comparison to WordPress. So they're going to need kind of your maintenance in the end. Yeah, it makes sense. I get kind of concerned thinking about like switching to Webflow because I feel like my team would just go crazy with wanting to develop stuff really fast. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And it's like, whoa, like we don't even have the energy to think about, you know, what we're going to be marketing next. You know, we're trying to figure out our, our roadmap and how to continue improving it and things like that. And like, sure, you're getting ready to make this page and it might take a few weeks for you to work on it. But like, if they're freed from having to spend all that time thinking about and executing, like, I wonder what, we would do with all their time, you know? 
Yeah, that's that can be a problem from time to time. I mean, uh, first of all, on the scope creep, as you've said, kind of with many clients, we start working and then when they see how fast it is, the projects just become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can never complete it. So we're always kind of, whoa, 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 let's let's tone it down. Let's launch something kind of maybe the exactly as you have it on your website or like maybe a redesign of that and then start adding features uh, kind of from time to time. But I mean, recently we just launched uh, kind of a direct mail campaign for our client while b- working on the kind of main marketing website and just kind of launched, uh, I think, 400 pages in a week with a CMS, uh, just basically changing the logo of the company. They're going to be reaching out to uh, some copy around the page and just kind of some specific contact key persons that they're going to be reaching out to. So, I mean, like, it's also great because your marketing team can start doing the job they actually like instead of just focusing on how are we going to complete this small project and then kind of work on the next one. And they have like hundreds of them in the background. So, as you know, I've got this podcast and I built a WordPress website for my podcast two years ago. It's absolutely horrific. I'm using the Divi theme, which you may have heard of. Possibly. Yeah, I think okay. they've sold like $80 million worth of licenses. Incredible, incredible. incredible. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic plugin, great UI UX components, but I'm not a designer. And I was thinking about hiring my startups designer, which shh, nobody needs to know. <laughs> I was thinking about hiring the designer to help me to do a redesign of the WordPress site and then a developer to help me redevelop the podcast site as I'm turning it into an education company. But I think it would be cool to play around with Webflow, but I don't know anything about it. So let's assume I'm an individual kind of solo entrepreneur in that regard. How would I get started with understanding Webflow and possibly playing around with it? You know, assuming I I don't have a budget to work with someone like you to, to design, you know, to do it for you, do it for me. Yeah, yeah, of course. I feel like Webflow is really different from any other platform in that case, just because they have their own university. So, I mean, there are many courses you can pay for whatever online, but I don't think any of them are worth it. Webflow has technically created a movie like set for kind of all of their tutorials. And you can go on the university and let's say in a month, you're going to be able to create a pretty simple website afterwards. So on your side, you're not going to have some advanced features, some advanced functionalities or whatever. So just going to Webflow University and then kind of you're going to be all set by watching kind of a lot of tutorials completely for free. And then afterwards, uh, another great part about Webflow is the community itself, because I haven't seen anybody that committed to the community uh, just because Webflow was pretty small and like it was uh, really dedicated to the community. Anything you search for, you're going to either find a YouTube video kind of maybe by me or by other agencies kind of that are kind of doing that for free. There is a forum. So any question you post, like somebody from the forum is going to answer you or somebody somebody might actually had that problem. So you're going to be able to see how to fix that uh, kind of in general on the forum. And that's all only if you want to learn Webflow actually kind of how it works and just kind of play around with it. But there is also the other part that is kind of the template marketplace. So in that case, you're going to be able to clone the template, see how it works, and then basically reverse engineer your website to to look how you how you want it it to look like from your kind of from your designs. And that's how you're going to be able to see kind of how the CMS works and just kind of see what they were able to do with the CMS uh, and kind of what are all the features you can play around with in Webflow. So like I know with WordPress, like I said, kind of like using the Divi theme, I can use front end blocks. So I don't have to code anything. All all of the the details of the elements are there. So like if I want to change the spacing or the borders or the colors of anything, it's literally a click. Like I don't have to I don't have to code a single line. So it it is in itself a a no code solution. Um, How much no code is Webflow? Would it would I have to code anything or would it also have these kind of front end blocks that I could play with? Yeah, so I feel like Webflow is a no code in a good sense, just because it's going to teach you the front end and actually uh, you're actually going to understand how the web works versus the DV theme and kind of all the other themes. You just have a preset of things. You you don't actually care what I do. You just know that that's going to change the color of your border or whatever. So on the right side of Webflow, you're going to have a panel that's going to have all of the, I mean, there's going to have padding, margin, sizes, colors, transitions. Uh, they also have an interaction pedal that is completely no code in that sense. 
So you're going to have all the possibilities to do, but you're actually need to you're actually going to need to know what every single CSS property is going to actually do uh, before actually pulling the trigger. So it's going to require you to actually under, understand a little bit of uh, how how the front end works in the end. Yeah, so it's something that it it sounds a little more complicated for someone like me who I've done website, I've built websites before, but I never learned CSS. Like I learned HTML, you know, I, I learned a little bit of JavaScript, I guess, but like, I don't know anything about CSS and like, I'm sure I could learn, but I'd rather not. I'd rather like pay someone else to do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I feel like Webflow is doing maybe a little bit of a bad marketing on that side, just because everybody is coming into Webflow expecting it to be completely no code. They're like that any, I mean, that's their whole kind of mission for the future that anybody can build a website. But at the moment, uh, how the situation is kind of kind of going at the moment is for every single client, we're writing a lot of custom JS. So you're going to have a custom calculator. You're going to have a custom uh, onboarding flow, kind of a custom integration with Greenhouse or whatever. And all of that is going to require JS work, API integration, uploading it, it to ABS and et cetera, et cetera. But that's us. We are an agency. And then also kind of if you're a designer, if you're passionate about uh, front end development, you're going to do great. But if you're just expecting everything to work as in Figma, just kind of dropping things in and positioning everything absolute, like in Wix or whatever, that's not going to be the case. You need to build everything from the ground up. So like kind of positioning the wrapper, positioning the section, the container, then the grid, then what goes into the grid, like a column, then a heading, then having a global heading, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it takes the whole development process, but you're just building visually. You're never going to write a line of code for CSS usually or HTML. In Webflow, everything is going to be a drag and drop. Kind of what you see is what you get editor in the end. I mean, Figma is uh, what you see is what you get. However, that's a very basic kind of a use case. And what I found is they do have these constraints and grids and auto layouts and scale and things that you can actually create a design system with and you can make things really beautiful and functional. So Figma, Figma is great as a no-code solution because at the basic level, you basically drag and drop. But if you want more control and you want to, to develop standards, then you need to learn how those functions work. So it seems like Figma and Webflow are kind of similar in that regard. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And kind of basically in Webflow, the, the thing that we like doing the most is creating those kind of design systems, as that's what companies are paying for the most, is we go in, we create, let's say you're going to create a lot of sections, you're going to have micro components like labels, buttons, uh, kind of all of the items on that front. And then when, when I hand off the website, for example, to you, you're going to have like a 100, 200, 300 uh, components you're going to be able to play around with and create new pages, create new experiences and everything like that on Webflow. Uh, and you're going to know that everything has been QA'd, everything works, that you cannot break anything, that you don't have to worry about CSS or anything else, that you can just kind of start playing around and then basically give the marketing people kind of access to Webflow with the components and every single marketing person can create the website on their own. So like they have content, they are not going to be so creative that every single time they're designing a new page, but it's maybe even better for scaling a, a company instead of kind of thinking that a creative solution is going to attract customers sometimes is going to be more about a content and how you position yourself and not just creating the most creative approach to a to a section or whatever and losing time on it so i feel like if you start giving this to your marketing team they can go pretty nuts after creating a design system what's the hardest thing about pushing webflow as an agency because i know it's very easy to go yeah we'll build you a website what do you use wordpress like people don't even ask, oh, are you using WordPress or Webflow? Like I, maybe the tide's changing. Maybe people are going, oh, are you Webflow or, or WordPress? But I, I feel like a lot of like entrepreneurs probably don't even know or care. They're just like, oh, you can build a website. All right, let's go. Yeah, that's that, that's true. I mean, specifically to the kind of percentage of forty percent of uh, the internet being on WordPress, like that's just the number itself. Like no, just zero point five people actually know about Webflow. I feel like recently it started to become a lot easier before we had problems like two years ago, like it was really a selling process. So like it was five meetings, just kind of showcasing it, creating a website in Webflow for free, technically a landing page just to showcase to the client how good the editor is, how good the kind of the designer is and all the features. But recently it's starting to get a lot easier with their marketing being uh, kind of upped a little bit. 
But there are problems as we are a European agency uh, and the Webflow being a US based company with GDPR and everything. So that's where we have problems and where clients actually get pushed away from Webflow in the end. Just because they're a US company, all of the data is transferring to US and then from US to a global CDN afterwards. So it became a really a pain to create a Webflow website GDPR compliant, and then you're going to lose some of the Webflow core features so you can make actually the website GDPR compliant in the end. Okay, let's let's discuss this just f real fast. So my company is from Singapore. I'm American. We use a German, uh, I think our, our Google server is in Germany, just because we really don't want to deal with American servers. So how does a how does an American company be GDPR compliant and use Webflow Webflow together? So you can be GDPR compliant up to a point. So like kind of we do custom cookies, uh, kind of to defer all of the scripts and everything like that. The way we develop it, we download Google fonts and kind of many of those small features. Uh, but then in the end, the final piece of hosting is going to be a problem. So you're going to use use you're going to have to use other softwares that are basically pulling from the Webflow hosting, removing some of the Webflow scripts, because for example, Webflow.js is always going to be sending data to, to Webflow in, in its core in the US, and then re-uploading that on another server uh, without that, that kind of data and ha having it that live that way. So it's a little bit of a pain if you want to be fully GDPR compliant, but we see that many companies in the end not actually don't care, but don't actually go to that extent. They implement everything possible on Webflow and just kind of have it there as Webflow is slowly working on GDPR. Like they have it in their kind of roadmap. So hopefully when they uh, release GDPR compliance fully on Webflow, um, I have no idea what's going to be the, the kind of final timeline. Maybe by that point, the GDPR kind of laws are going to become even stricter that they get uh, kind of some uh, I, I, fines or whatever on, the, on that side. Okay, something just happened in your room. Your light changed. I don't know what that's about. Uh, yes. <laughs> so like half of your my face is like blue or purple. Yeah, yeah. My light just overheated for some reason. That can that can happen. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, we can we can do this way. So, so Webflow is working on building GDPR compliance. What happens then to the companies you've helped? to create GDPR compliance kind of by doing it yourself, does an update from Webflow mess up their compliance? How does that work? No, I mean, on that side, I feel like we're just going to have less things to worry about because technically that's another software we're paying for to make sure that the website is GDPR compliant and other hosting on top of Webflow. So we're going to be able just to kind of cut that end loose, kind of reduce the cost on our clients and they can continue with just Webflow again. So it shouldn't impact anything if you just kind of go ahead and make the website, website GDPR compliant on that side. Okay. So is it possible for you to kind of create a script that just like makes every project GDPR compliant or do you have to manually change everything every time? Yeah, so I would love to if there is a script to create something like that. But as you know, every single client uses different kind of marketing scripts, different uh, kind of uh, integrations on their website. So in the end, it's going to be pretty hard for them to kind of automate everything. So it's a manual process we have to do and you have to check it kind of constantly. So it's like, let's say, a week's of process to make sure that none of the scripts are t triggering before needed or whatever. Well, that's fine. You just charge them more money, right? Just go, oh, you want GDPR yeah. compliance? <laughs> Check mark. Okay, let's add $5,000. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. I mean, there's that. There's multi language, just because we're using Weglot for multi language. Like, it's another tool. So, like, that's another feature that, that some clients require. So, that's another scope because you need to do QA. Integration itself is easy, but you need to do QA, make sure that everything works on German specifically, that the website doesn't break when it's in German, et cetera, et cetera. That reminds me of H and R Block. It's a tax agency in America that's like very well known. I use them to file my taxes in America, and they basically charge you like extra based on the number of forms. Like, oh, you need this form, you need that form, you need that form. Yeah, no problem. Extra fifty dollars, extra two hundred dollars, yeah. five hundred dollars, whatever. It's um, it's a good way to do business. It's very easy. You go, oh yeah, I know how much it's going to yeah. cost me to provide this service to you, so I'm just going to add this. Just you know. 
provide a checklist. So actually, let's let's talk yes. about this. That's actually, I mean, yeah. I mean, on the previous topic, I mean, I, I hope to integrate some sort of items on that side, on our side, just because we're technically so really time-based. So hopefully with time, a little bit more value-based because we just organized uh, like our unofficial three-year anniversary for our company and the agency that does the organizations, they take 10, they take 10% of the costs. So like you spend 10K like on the events, they're gonna get 10%. You spend 100K on the events, they're gonna get 10%. And the, they do the, exa the exact same amount of work in the end. Mm. So let's get into the cost of this. How much would it cost to develop a standard, small to medium business style, you know, Webflow website? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I feel like if you have the designs, like it can be in the range of five to 10,000 euros. So if you have the designs, kind of we just go ahead and make, go ahead and develop everything, you don't have some specific requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So on that side, it can be affordable looking at that it's much quicker than uh, any of the other tools on the web. If you go, kind of as you go, like if you require maybe an agency like us to develop the, to the develop and design the website, it can go, go as high as like 20 to 30K. If you need some more custom integrations, it can go to 30 to 50K and then it can scale from there. But I would say on our side, like 20,000 euros to like 30, 40,000 euros is our kind of usual kind of project base. But they're also freelancers on that side. So if somebody doesn't really care about having the, the top notch kind of certifications that they need for the website, they can develop the website under $5,000 in the end. But by a free freelancer or something, there is a Webflow experts uh, kind of group also. So you're going to be able to choose between enterprise partners that we are, or go ahead and choose a professional partner that is maybe going to be a little bit cheaper on that front uh, to develop the website. So there are going to be a lot of options, but just make sure to hopefully go with certified experts and just see how much that's going to cost and kind of know that they're going to give you a real price uh, in terms of cost and how, is, how much it's going to cost to develop the website. I wouldn't go and hire developers on Upwork. That can be one of the hard things just because I started there, but then it became really popular looking at that there are many, that there's a lot of jobs and that the, the market is booming. So everybody that was a WordPress developer just switched their title to a Webflow developer and they can mess up a lot of things and kind of not develop it properly. So experts channel can be the best, uh, like experts that webflow.com can be the best place to find people to, to work for your project. So how do you know someone's certified? Webflow actually has like courses they run, then they certify this themselves or? Yeah, yeah. So basically, first of all, I mean, uh, depending on the professional partner on the enterprise partner for the enterprise side, you need to have enterprise clients to even be considered for a professional one. You send over five or six websites you've been built uh, and you also send the back end of that. So the Webflow can check that. So it's a really manual process. So you, you're going to you're going to know that you're getting some, somebody good in the end if you go with, a, with the experts channel. Sometimes like the only problems that I saw is sometimes people are overbooked. So that's the only the only place where you can have a bad experience. But apart from that, everybody is really nice and kind of webflow certifying them. They have usually people have a badge on their website on the bottom right. So you can see if they're a professional or an enterprise partner. So you can know that you're in a good place. So it sounds to me like there's an opportunity for you to help more people get certified in Webflow so that the cost per developer goes down because there's a higher supply. Well, I I don't like to look at it that way just because I usually like to be on a, a, on the expensive side and I feel like there's a lot of value in the, in the thing we're doing. So if you're comparing us with a development agency that will develop something for six to 12 months on a usual development schedule, clients, even if they pay 30, 40 K for a website, they're saving a hundred to hundred thousand euros in the end, comparing it to a kind of a full development flow. So with the services we're offering, I'm not even worried about that kind of the costs are going to become lower as web for uh, adds more and more features. There are going to be more and more complex features to add, and then the custom integrations we've done. So I'm, I'm not kind of too worried about pricing kind of going down with that. Well, I wasn't referring to your price going down. I was referring to yeah, yeah. your cost for hiring someone to do the work <laughs> for your agency. Uh, yeah. So like yeah. you were saying that you're worried some people are overbooked, which means there's tremendous demand and not enough supply. And when that happens, the developers can charge higher prices. And so if there's more developers with those skills, there will be less people who are overbooked, which means you can afford to hire more people and scale faster at a lower cost to yourself. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, we have one of the benefits uh, as, live, as we're living in niche Serbia, like the, the wage costs are much lower than in anywhere else. And then basically all of our team members are full time kind of in-house in our agency. We have a hybrid model of working. So we usually take a front end developer. We have kind of a boot camp of three months and then a front end dev because of what becomes a web flow develop developer. So we have a pretty good lead flow of people actually coming into our agency, learning web flow and then working for us. And then technically earning higher wages than if they would uh, kind of as a front end developer just because they can do that much more with web flow in the end. Hmm. Fair enough. I, I was kind of thinking about it as like, you could do like an internship program with like younger people who want to learn development, where you can give them an opportunity to gain experience working for you. And then you can get them certified through Webflow. And, yeah. and so you get people who are young and hungry, energetic, and then you get, you know, great work out of people who are trying to build up. And then, you know, if they stay with you, they stay with you. And if not, they go off into the world and do their own thing. But, you know, you can kind of be like an incubator because you were you were talking before about how uh, you're the leader of a no code community. So, like, are you doing that? Are you like offering these people who are looking to get into Webflow these opportunities or? Yeah, that's that's exactly what we're hoping to do. Kind of as I'm freeing up my time as a CEO a lot. So before, like until like I think two months ago, like my time was really tied up, so I could not focus on any external projects. So right now, kind of this is something we started around a month ago, and we're hoping to do exactly as you said, attract a lot more people from Serbia, from the region to Buffalo. Hopefully, teach them, kind of not like hire them for internships. We have paid internships. I don't like free internships. So like. They're not getting great never salaries, said, but they're getting paid. I lot. never said free. You should always pay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there are agencies here that are doing s stuff like that, like with free internships or whatever. So, like, just just saying on that front that uh, that's that's not what we're we're doing. But yeah, it's it's a great thing to do. And as you said, I never thought about actually getting them uh, kind of actually certified. But that's also a really great technique to have a lot more people being a, that much more hungrier to work and to do that much better in the end. Yeah. So for example, like with my team, you know, when I am hiring people, I'll say to them, what are your career goals? Right. And how can I help you to reach those goals? And oftentimes they'll go, oh, I want to get a certification in this. I want to get a certification in that. And like, you know, it's a few hundred dollars or a thousand, two thousand dollars for that certification. So, you know, my goal is I want my company to be able to pay for that because it's expensive for them. And if they get that certification, it means that there's more value that they can bring to the company. And even if after they get the certification, they choose not to stay with us and to go somewhere else, I mean, whatever, that's their decision. But I, I see kind of my role as, as the owner of a company to help upskill the people as much as possible. So for example, like I just hired a video editor for the podcast because obviously we're doing video now and I have experience in video editing, but not in managing two streams, two, two video tracks where you've got to sometimes show just my face or sometimes jo show just your face. So like it becomes really complicated at that point. And he's 19 from the Philippines. And I, uh, for the startup, I have a lot of people from the Philippines. I'm used to working with their culture. And I told him, I said, look, I know you're young. I know you're hungry. I want to upskill you from being a video editor to being a producer. I want you to become so good at what you do that you, I don't have to do anything but give you the raw file and you turn it into a beautiful show. I want to trust you completely to make all of these creative decisions. And he was like, that sounds great. You know, I said, and I want you to look into the analytics of how these videos perform so that you can be informed or you can make better decisions about how to edit the videos in the future so that the quality of the content you're producing becomes better so that you can also inform me about how I can, you know, do better recordings so that I can make the show more interesting to make it easier for you to do your job as a producer. And he's like mind blown at 19. Like, here's this stranger. He's just hired me for a job. And he's like thinking about my future and how he's going to, you know, help me do all these things. It's like, that's how I look at all of the people I hire is like, how can I make you the best possible person that I possibly can with your career? So that even if you don't do it for me in the future, like you'll have those skills because I never got that when I was working for other people. And I desperately wanted that because I felt like, everyone I worked with had no idea 
what I was capable of. I could, I knew what I was capable of, but I never had anyone go, let me hold your hand. Let me help you. Let me give you opportunities. Let me pay for your upskilling. Let me, you know, do this and that. They're just like, this is your job. Stick to it. It's like, I didn't stay with those companies very long because I felt no connection to them whatsoever other than a paycheck. It's like, I loved the idea of what I wanted to do, but I didn't feel like I had any opportunity for growth. So there was no reason to stay. And I think, especially with Gen Z, there is this very strong urge to have a sense of purpose at their job. And if they don't, if they don't see the opportunity for growth, if they don't see that the owners care about them, they're not going to stay loyal. So I feel like for you, especially in Serbia, especially in in that area of of the world, I think there's tremendous opportunity and tremendous hunger for young people to have opportunities to make more than the minimum wage of what is it like 700 euros, 800 euros in Serbia. So yeah, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I, I recently started implementing that in our agency. So like, for example, we have a really senior designer for Miami like that we could not afford to be full time. And then he basically has weekly calls with our designers, has one on ones with the designers. So like they can grow and kind of le- learn a lot more. Almost everybody from the company has English les- lessons because I was lucky in a sense that I think I speak good English, but like many people have a really bad accent or they're not se- just not secure to talk to people. So like we pay for everybody's English English les- lessons. For Webflow people, one thing that is technically differentiating Webflow people is knowing JS. So that's what we're really focused on that kind of, okay, you're a Webflow developer, everybody can develop in Webflow, they can learn with time, like let's say in a year, you can become a really good Webflow developer. But then we're, we also hired an, hired an external consultant for JS. So that if they don't know how to write JS for something, the, the guy is writing it and then they sit down and kind of just kind of deconstruct it, just see how it, how it works. So I, I also see a huge value kind of, we have a fund that everybody can use for paying any courses or whatever they want to. So uh, th- that's the, the biggest thing that motivates people in the end or kind of boot camps. We went to conferences together and like I like for the first conference we went to together, that's where I saw all of the benefits you just said. Just because I was more of kind of, we're going to learn things, we're going to do items or whatever. But it was more that people who were invited to the conference were really honored that the company is going to pay for accommodation, that they're going to pay for trip, uh, kind of all the lunches there and whatever. And just kind of coming back from a single conference, we came back that much more bonded and that much more with a purpose. Whereas before that, so it is something that I'm looking to invest a lot more in the future. And uh, I would love to also get on a call after the podcast with you just to get a lot more tips on how to motivate people a bit more. Yes, as you have uh, a little bit more experience in that area. Yeah, that would be good. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm glad that you're doing that. It's really cool. And what are you, you were what, 24, was it? 23, I don't know. 23. 23. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, People from my, like, so, uh, people from my generation, I, I just turned 36 yesterday and I straddle the millennial Gen X line. I'm like not even close to the Gen Z line. A lot of people in my generation don't see things the way you do or people even older than me, they don't see it the same way you do. And so I think having that kind of conversation with you about, Oh, this is, you know, something you can do for your team. It's like, yeah, duh. Like, of course, that's what I want. Why wouldn't I give that to them? Um, I see, I think a lot of people my age and a little bit older, they don't see it as they don't see that very well. So I'm glad that you're, you're doing that. It's really cool. Um, yeah. So, I mean, from that side, uh, I mean, I'm looking at it more like everything I'm doing, my team is able to do. So like, if I'm able to not come to work on Friday or whatever, start to work on Friday at 3 PM, like I shouldn't be mad at my people, like for coming to work at 3 PM, maybe on Friday or whatever. Sometimes let's say you go to a party or something like you might be hangover. Like we have a normal company culture. Like if somebody's hangover, they're going to say, I'm not going to do almost anything productive today. I'm just kind of here to chill or whatever. And that's completely fine. So that's what you I feel need to understand with a company that everybody's as the same as you are and you should treat it that way. And then the company is going to scale much faster looking at it. Well, that's why I decided to never have an office anywhere and to basically have no, no determination of when people work because a lot of the people we hire are either engaged, married or have kids. There's like, I think two people who are single, that's me and one of the other, um, one of the other employees. And so 
I want to be wherever I want, whenever I want. Right. So I spent three weeks in Greece and then two weeks in Slovenia. Now I'm a week in Spain and I'll be here for another week or two. And then I'll be in Portugal for at least a month or two. So like I want to move around. So why can't my team? I don't want to work at eight in the morning. Maybe I want to start work at noon. Like, you know, everyone should be able to make a determination for themselves of where, you know, where do I work? best? When do I work best? And have I taken care of my personal life first so that I can come to work thinking, you know, of just about work and nothing else? Because I know I've been there when I was married and I would have a fight with my wife, which when I was married, right? I'm divorced now. (laughs) When I was married, if I had a fight with my wife, it ruined the rest of my day. I couldn't think about work. I was only thinking about what went wrong and how can I try to resolve it when I get to see her next, you know, in the evening. It's like, you know, if you're, if your kid gets sick and you have to take him to the doctor and you're sitting at work, like you're not thinking about work. You're thinking about taking your kid to the doctor, like get off the computer and go take your kid to the freaking doctor. Like take care of your personal life first before you think about work. So I think there's this huge cultural shift. And I think COVID's really the thing that set it off. Um, there's this guy I am going to interview really soon. And one of the things that he does for his team is he gives them all virtual reality headsets so they can play together. It's like they play mini golf and, and, uh, you know, table tennis and all that. So like, Hey, I want to blow off some steam. What else you want to go play some uh, mini golf with me? Yeah, sure. No problem. It's like, you know, I, I see a lot of really cool stuff that people are starting to do now for their teams. Yeah, but I, but I also have a different point of that. Kind of technically, we have an office and we have like a four hundred square meter office, or whatever. Like there's like a coffee shop, there is a, I don't know table tennis and all the usual stuff you have in the office, whatever. Focus rooms and stuff like that. But I feel like specifically for younger people, we really like to bond with each other and kind of even like we just we met. Kind of we're gonna be talking over podcast or whatever. But there is nothing that, that that's gonna be replacing the face to face conversation. And then also the first time you speak to somebody face to face, the next time you jump on a meeting, you're going to have maybe a, a thing you did together to laugh about or whatever, and only then talk about work and just kind of have that much better connection. So that's why on our side, we usually have people for the first three months mandatory to be in the office. So they meet everybody who's at that point in the office and just kind of meet the team and can become that much more bonded to the company. And then when they know everybody, whatever, they can go ahead, travel, do whatever they want to, or like kind of like live their own life, as, as you said, like with no constraints. But they at least met everybody in person. They know how, how everybody's feeling, how like how they should talk to different people. Just because I feel like when I talk with somebody in person, I know how they're going to react after that. And I know how I'm going to be talking to them. Whereas online, like you're going to talk to everybody in the same way. And that can maybe come off wrong in the end. That's you're not going to feel the emotions. Yeah, it's difficult because for us, our team is spread across like nine different countries. So yeah, that's true. I, and I know... So for example, I wanted to, so I went to Greece in April and my hope was that the company could afford to pay for all of the execs. There's, there's five of us to meet in Greece together because one of the guys is from Greece and one of the girls was living in Turkey and it's like an hour from Istanbul, whatever. Um, so figured, okay, she can come. I can, you know, I'll be there. He's going to be there. And then the other two guys, one is in Malaysia and one is in the Philippines. Now the guy in Malaysia has got a wife and kids. The guy in the Philippines has a wife and kids, you know, me and the girl in, um, uh, in Turkey, we're both single. So it's easy for us to travel around the guy in Greece. has got a wife and kids. So I wanted to bring those other two guys over and they're like, I don't know how you expect me to get there without my wife and like I'm I I can't go there for a week or two and leave my wife and kids behind. It's just it's not going to happen. So if you want to pay for them to come to Greece too, okay, but otherwise like we we just can't do that, especially because the guy in Malaysia his kids like a year old. You know. Yeah. Um and I was like we can't afford to do that. So you know, let's wait another year or two. But like the guy in Malaysia, I've known for 20 plus years. Like I've, I've known him in person for many, many years of my life. Um, but I got to meet the, my marketing director who's in Greece. And when I get to Portugal in a few weeks, I'll be able to meet my product manager who's now living there. She's moved from Turkey to, to Portugal, just like I'm moving to Portugal. So I'll get to work with her more face to face and all that. So that's good. But my, my hope is that the team moves around and meets each other. And actually some of the guys in the Philippines have met each other and gone on holiday together, you know, with their wives and kids and all that. So that's good. But like, 
um, you know, we've got a person in Pakistan, a person in India now, a person in Greece and Portugal, Malaysia and, and the Philippines. And like, it's, it's not easy to get everyone together, you know, for us, but yeah, that's true. That, that's true. I feel like that's, that's a trade-off. So you were probably going to get a little bit better talent just because you have the whole world to choose from instead of choosing from your area. But I feel like on our side, we have maybe a little bit more tighter culture in the company. So we're going to be making up for that loss of talent, like maybe on, on that global scale, because we have a much closer culture in the company and just kind of we're scaling as that. Yeah. So one of the things that we do is we use Altspace VR. I don't know if you've heard of it. I haven't yet. No, no. So some of us have uh, VR headsets. Actually, I left mine in America, so now one of us has a VR headset. And you can also access it from a desktop. And there's this game. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Cards Against Humanity. Yeah, yeah. So someone created a virtual reality version of it. And it's called... Uh, I can't, I can't remember the name. Anyways, it's basically the same thing. So like we'll get 10 people together or eight people together and we'll play this game. And it's a lot of fun because you get to see how people think and how they put together like their answers. And you can start to see patterns of like, for example, one of the, one of the team members, like every time they will pick my answer. And they don't know it's my answer, but they like my humor. And so, like, you get to see, oh, who's picking who, and not because they have any way of knowing who's submitted the answer, but they can, you can intuitively understand the psychology behind the way they think and what makes them laugh and therefore why they chose that thing. And so you can see, oh, this person's humor fits this person's, you know, so you can, you can see those connections. And that's really cool because it's unspoken and probably nobody else on the team is thinking about it except for me uh, because of my background. It's like I look into the deeper connections and all that. So, so that's something fun that we do. Um, but I mean, yeah, I would love to arrange for people to get together. There's this place on Airbnb. It's like you can rent an island for like a thousand dollars a night or something like on an island. You get an island. It has like a building and there's wait staff and it's like all the food and everything is included. They do everything for you for like, it's like a thousand dollars a night for like, let's say 10, 15 people. So I'm like, that sounds great. You know, let's rent an Island for a week for 10 people. You know, it's only seven, eight grand. It's like fantastic. But then of course you got to pay for them to fly there and for visa if there's anything. So like, of course it's not just seven or eight grand. It's like maybe 20 grand, but, um, and also timelines is everybody going to be available. Like he's their kid's birthday on that day. And so they're not going to come or whatever. So like, there are also many different oh, things. To, to you just bring of. their kid and let them celebrate their birthday on the Island. <laughs> Yeah, but okay, yeah, we're younger, so like there's gonna be probably some drinking involved if we're on an island and then kids together on that front are not gonna uh, play out so so well. But but yeah, I guess that's us. We are like usually up until 25, 26 are people in our agency. So like I still have to come to those problems slowly. Like I just came to vacations for the first time with a team of 25 people. So that's not a nightmare to organize just because I'm um, to everybody. You don't need notice. You're going to take a vacation whenever you want to, but I just have, but, and then I'm just kind of working overtime or whatever, just to figure out how to plan all the workloads without them that they shouldn't worry about because they have a job. They shouldn't worry about when they're going to take a vacation or like whatever. Mm. Sounds like you need a, an operational manager directors. If you don't have one now, let that, let them do that. <laughs> that's their job. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. I mean, like we're scaling people from uh, kind of the inside of the organization. So like, kind of, we just have technically a CTO from recently kind of for Webflow, technically a unique CTO position uh, from a developer that has been working with us. I mean, since I started working six years ago, whatever, like not technically full time six years ago, but yeah. Uh, slowly as kind of the time progresses, hopefully we're going to have some more people kind of coming up. Uh, just because, I mean, I'm a little bit scared of hiring externally, but I know that's the thing that's going to move your business that much further in having somebody that has completely different uh, kind of points of things that you're doing in business in the end. The best advice that I can give you from this point of view is if you want the opportunity to be completely needless, you know, completely unnecessary in, your, in this business, hire a daily operations manager, director, COO, whatever you want to call them. Give them control over managing the human side of the business. And then you just get to be the fun guy. <laughs> I never thought about that. I, I might, I might think of who can be from, from our team or hiring externally. That's that, that's true. I'm, uh, I don't know. Have you read the book, the E-Myth? 
I've heard of it. I think you're like the second person to mention it in the last few weeks, but I haven't read it. Yeah, it's great. So that's how I'm trying to slowly as the business is older and older run it. Uh, technically, he says kind of how when you go to the best uh, hotel there is, you're always going to get the same experience and just kind of kind of conveying that into your business, how every single client that comes, even if you're there, if you're not, if you're busy or if you're not, that they have the exactly the same business and that it's completely catered kind of to your customer. Like for example, McDonald's, whenever in the world you go to McDonald's, they have a, an unbelievably good process and everything is just going to work. And that's how I'm starting to think of my business. And then we're just hiring a customer success manager. So as we have a lot of clients turnover, like earning money from the existing customers is probably the best thing we can do, but we're not. So just kind of interacting with them, seeing what they like, what they didn't like, and just kind of improving that process. Mm. So, but the operations manager is going to for sure be the next position I'm going to be looking at either kind of promoting somebody to or something similar. Yeah. So the way that I see it is any position that takes your time, any task that is repeatable and takes your time is a task you shouldn't be doing. So let's say you spent 50 or 100 hours thinking about just planning that holiday for your team. If you had an operations manager, they could do it or they could have an assistant and that assistant's job is to organize everything so that they can still think about how to manage the rest of the daily stuff so that you can think about how you can train your customer success managers so that they can think about what they need to be asking people so that you can increase your revenue from your existing customers before they churn out. Right. So like I was talking to a guy uh, recently who hit a, a revenue ceiling because he's running his business by himself. He's making 20 grand a month, but he's doing it everything himself. And he's sitting there, he's your age, he's 23 and he's enjoying himself. He's saving a hundred percent of the money because he has no cost living at home with his parents. And I'm like, do you want to spend the rest of your twenties making 20 grand a month? Or do you want to hire someone to handle your, you know, nonsense stuff that you do so you can have the time to think about how to grow to a hundred thousand a month or more. And he's like, Oh, that would be great. You know, I was like, so why aren't you hiring someone? He's like, I hadn't thought of it. It's like, okay, well yeah, that's true. I, I, now you have the thought. Now you have the thought. Now you have to decide what do you want? Do you want to be a company with employees or do you want to be a freelancer who keeps all of the money for himself? I'd rather have a business that does tens of millions of dollars a year and has a team to share it with than to have a hundred thousand a year and keep it to myself or 200,000 a year, whatever, and keep it to myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree there. And, and it, I know in my process, just because let's say if you're making 20K, to make 20K again as a company profitably, you're going to need to hire that much people and you're going to have that much more revenue in the end to kind of her, have that kind of clean cash in the end. But that is allowing me to, let's say in July, go to Africa for 10 days and not open my laptop. Whereas previously, if I was away for 10 days, everything would be falling apart and I would be probably stressed out or burned out in like two years or whatever. So it's it's not the way out. The exactly. End. An operations manager allows you to go away for two months and the company does or a year and the company doesn't burn down because I mean, obviously you have to trust them but like operations managers as well. Like they're not just managing the people. They're also managing, you know, like all of the different departments and what is your uh, dat data structures look like? How does data flow between departments? You know, how do you manage your server load? How do you manage, um, you know, uh, different uh, revenue sources? Like there, there's a lot of different things that they can do. It depends on what you're good at, what you want to do and things like that. My, my COO is like a godsend. He's incredible. Seriously. <laughs> Like my, my, I told, yeah. I've, I've only said this publicly once before my company would have burned to the ground years ago if I hadn't hired this guy, but, and he's a good friend of mine for 22 years. So I knew that I could trust him. Yeah. Yeah. Our lead project manager, like he's technically the exactly the same thing just for projects, just because I know our company would burn down. Like if we didn't have our lead project manager, so probably the next step is maybe hiring a few more project managers going to be need her just because we have three, but just to, so she doesn't have to focus on project management and then just kind of slowly progress into the operational manager and just kind of think of all the procedures I'm thinking of slowly, I guess. You just said something perfect. If she's really good at what she does, take her out of it and have her train and manage other people. And you know that you'll trust her because you trust her now. However, you also need to focus on, I don't know if she has experience managing people, but managing managers is a totally different game. So you have to be aware that um, 
you know, she is capable of managing managers. Cause it's one thing if she's managing people who do the work in the project, but it's another to manage the people who manage the people who manage the, who do the project. Yeah. And that's what I'm scared of the most. Uh, like I've tried having, let's say a three way company, like let's say it's me, it's a manager and then it's somebody doing the job. And then it's really easy to know how everybody feels and just to know the feedback loop is not that high. But as soon as you introduce the next, the fourth step, I'm kind of scared of losing uh, kind of maybe either some data or losing some feedback from our customers or losing feedback from our employees. In the and end. that's why you need but an operations it's, it's manager because it's their full-time job to do that stuff for you. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's, I have the to-do list on that It's side, the yeah. introduction of that next layer that enables your company to get to 10 or $20 million a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's for sure what, what I'm going to be introducing. Like, uh, it feels like it, it's also really scary in terms of cash flow, just because it's like, let's say we just added a customer success manager. It's not technically bringing you revenue, but it's bringing you revenue long term. So it's, it's again, an unbillable position. Like as you're, we are a small team, like, like I mean, 25 people is not a lot looking at a global scale, like another uh, non-billable person is going to be a little bit harder for the business, but I feel like it's going to be a really beneficial in the long term to actually scale from this, like from this cash, like we're going to too much further, further on. I bet if you hire an operations manager and two more project managers, and you remove yourself from the project, you remove yourself from the operations, in a year or two, you'll need to have 20 more customer su success managers. <laughs> that's true, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that's gonna be the case. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. But I'm also scared, and I know I, I'm not, not, not technically scared, but at the moment, let's say this is a, like let's say we'll bring in an operations manager, a few more devs and come to 30 to 40 people. Like it can be sort of a lifestyle business, whereas it's growing slowly, basically like, at one point, it's not going to cause any stress on me. I can focus on different things in life. Like us, I've skipped, let's say, six years from 15 to 23, working 20, 12, 16 hours days, and only recently started to travel a lot, started to enjoy life a little bit more. So I'm scared of should we go to, let's say, create a system to go to 100 people or should we not? I'm kind of still thinking that in my head. All that depends is what you want. The thing is, like, the you can do certain businesses in a lean way, but you, there are some things that are very resource intensive. So you can very easily have a team of a hundred and you might do $30 million a year. And if you only had 40 people, you might be stuck at 5 million a year. You know, you may need that large jump in order to, because a lot of them might just be salespeople right? You may have a ton of salespeople doing, you know, receiving inbound leads or doing outbound leads. Um, so it really all depends on, don't, don't focus on the number of 100. Just know that you have to decide what kind of a business you want and how big you want it to be and how much money you want to make and why you want to make that and how you're going to use it and how you can give back to your team and to your community and, and, you know, do the things that make you happy. And that that's kind of the most important thing. And don't think about the number, but just know your company will break at certain numbers of people as well as certain revenue, uh, revenue ceilings or plateaus or whatever you want to call it. So certain levels. So, you know, you'll you'll get through them if you want them if you want to and if you don't want them then you don't have to go to them but yeah yeah but i i feel like as some a, a really passionate person in terms of working i get to let's say 10 people then everything is working like perfectly then like it becomes boring after three months and then you're just being 15 like and then something breaks and you're kind of fixing everything again get to 20 fixing everything again 25 I mean, it's still great, but then probably right now I'm feeling like, okay, we can get a little bit more. So I, I have a little bit of a bigger challenge in how to manage that. And that the customer success is still at the point uh, that, that we had them before. So the, the way that I look at a traditional business is the more money you reinvest from the revenue, the more likely you're going to grow, the faster you'll get to those goals, the, the faster you'll break your business and that's fine. But again, it's, it's all decision-making, you know, like you could say, okay, my company does 5 million a year and there's like 2 million profit. I'm going to take 1.8 million home this year. And I'm going to invest 200,000 in marketing for the next year. Like, or you could say, I'm going to take 200,000 home this year and put 1.8 million into, you know, marketing and, and hiring and upskilling and, you know, whatever. So 
as a business owner, it's on you to decide what you want to do with that money. You know? Yeah, yeah, but I, I guess I have a pretty, um, pretty good place to live in, just because I don't have where to spend that money, or do I want to spend it? Like in the end, so it's much more fun for me. Like specifically lately, I don't even look at the numbers. It's more about uh, I know we make really good cash flow currently, and like we're reinvesting everything, kind of buying the best equipment. We just hired five more people to, on internship, like for three months test period so like we don't need them but like probably in three months when like two of them are good to start development they're gonna be able to join the team and continue there so yeah i feel like that's that's the thing that motivates me more is reinvesting and then scaling and seeing how people grow and specifically seeing how people grow just because i saw the same people three years ago and see them now and i'm like you're probably better at management than i am good job like how, how did this happen so it's fun well that's that's the best job that you can do is to make your team better at you than specific things so that you don't need to do those things there's a lot of things i do now still that i hate doing that i'm not good at like i'm i'm a generalist right which means i'm okay to good at a lot of things but i'm not great at anything and so I can start pretty much anything I need for the company, but then very quickly it breaks or it sucks. And so I need to hire someone who's a specialist in that thing to come and fix it and then, you know, build on it. So, yeah, but that's also, I feel like why you're a CEO, like, for example, let's say, uh, if you create a podcast like this, maybe first few podcasts are going to become bad. You're going to understand the process. You're going to know what to look for in a person you're hiring, and then you can kind of delegate it versus if you didn't know how to start it in the beginning, it would be really hard to hire somebody to start it for you or just to kind of organize it from the start in the end. I mean, yeah, I did a podcast years ago, years ago, just by myself. So this was the first time I did it with two people and I've been doing it for almost two years. I'm still editing the audio. Um, but now that I've gotten to video, I've hired a video editor because I am not messing with that because at the same time, the editor can do five minute clips for YouTube and like 40 second clips for all the other platforms which again, like I'm not going to play that stuff. I just, I don't have the energy for that. And that's one of the reasons why the podcast hasn't really blown up is because I didn't have the energy to invest in doing all of these different clips here and there and subtitles and all this, because I have the startup, <laughs> like I've got to run another company that yeah. has 12 employees and do this. And so it's, it's a lot of energy, a lot of uh, time yeah, yeah. taken up, but I am looking for a, a person to help me with the actual, um, sound part the audio part uh and i'm looking for potentially a va actually no i'm looking for someone to help me with um so like i've got transcriptions so I, i've done like this one click transcript generation for each of the episodes but i've got about 83 episodes that i haven't um fixed the transcriptions and turned them into chapters with timestamps so that i can put them on google and and youtube and all that so i'm actually looking for someone to help with that as well right now um, so not, not sure if you know anybody in Serbia who's looking for, for some extra work, um, but I'm willing to talk to them. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we, can, we can think about that. Like the, there are a lot of people that are doing copywriting that they can maybe adjust to uh, transcribe, transcribing or something like that. So yeah, that, that's a possibility. Yeah, copywriting isn't so important. It's, it's really being able to listen to the audio in English and then make sure that they fix the transcriptions because the transcription's already there. So they just have to fix it. So that's like the biggest problem is finding someone whose English level is high enough that they can hear what I'm saying. Um, and if their English is good enough, they can listen at 1.5x, so they can do it even faster. But it's like hundreds and yeah. hundreds and hundreds of hours of work easily to, to get all of them up to date. Because like I didn't do it before, so now I've got this massive backlog. And uh, it's really important to get chapters on YouTube to segment all the videos and things like that. So I'm like kind of, I'm trying to, like I, I spent almost the last two years doing everything for the podcast for myself. And then, you know, a few months ago, I was like, I'm broken. Like I love the podcast, but like I want to get into the video. And it's just going to be more complicated. So like, I need a sound engineer, I need a video engineer, and I need some like sort of VA, someone to help me with like the other additional stuff that like, I just can't like put the energy into anymore. So that's kind of my own journey. Yeah, there, there are a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of people teaching English in Serbia. So you're going to have a lot of pool of people to get them away from teaching uh, kind of English. Like they usually teach English for Japanese people, Chinese people or stuff, something like that. Really, Serbian so, people? And they're not earning. Yes, yes. How much are they they're, earning? Like they're 
Yeah, so like from 500 to 1,000 euros per month, something like that. It's a usual wage they're, they're earning. And they're working like eight hours a day and, and sometimes into some strange hours just because of the time zone differences uh, between the two, two countries. But for some people, it's it's fine. So like having a job to do something like engaging, uh, like a little bit more engaging just because the teaching becomes too repetitive mm. uh, and just kind of listening to podcasts or like doing something more can be a great pool of people for you. Yeah, I mean, the like... If anything, they should look at it like this. The knowledge they will gain by listening to these episodes is invaluable. The only thing I'm, I'm afraid is they're going to learn so much, they're going to think they can start their own company and then they're going to leave. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be like, damn, but I know how to be a CEO you're, you're, now. <laughs> yeah, but, but you said you, you want to upskill your, uh, all of your people. So like that's going to be one of the benefits for them. Like After listening to podcasts for six months, you can open up your business for free. No, I know, but like... Well, I guess after six months, I wouldn't need their help anymore. Maybe it depends. <laughs> if if they do other things, if they're like a an assistant for other things as well, then yeah, I'll, I have a reason to keep them on. But if they are just doing the transcripts, then like it's you know it's a a, a batch work, it's a project right now. And then oh, um, I hate to do this. Unfortunately, I just realized my time with the meeting room is done so we're gonna have to end this and i'll have to end no the recording it's been fantastic talking with you i'm gonna probably i'm gonna keep all of this i'm not gonna i may not publish all of it i'm not sure i haven't decided because i'm like trying to get into a membership program so like uh, like i may do half of the video is like free and then the other half is like only if you're a paying member I'm not sure. I'm trying like, plus I recorded our intro call. So I'm like trying to find ways to add value to the membership so that people like, Oh crap. Like I get to hear extra stuff that these CEOs are talking about with each other. So like I may end the, like after 40 minutes or so. And then like the rest is like, Oh, if you're a paying member, you can listen to us talk about like what we're actually doing inside of our businesses. Um, yeah yeah that could be the case i mean one of my friends like that, uh, that i showed you the podcast that i was in uh, he's doing like for paid members like they, he's sending the podcasts two weeks before so like they get a podcast first and then after that when it's public everybody else gets them yeah so like that's one of the things and then he's also doing a paid memberships uh kind of let's say a month with me and you so like for example we're gonna have a specific topic and i'm gonna do a workshop on on top of it so I don't know, for him, it's like 60 euros per month or something like that. And then the, he's offering five uh, CEOs doing some workshops. So for me, it might be something simple as developing a Webflow website and then actually showcasing how it looks on the screen. The thing that we talked about, somebody's doing a, a session about kind of leadership or something like that. Hmm. And then he had like a lot of like three to 500 people just paying him pretty easily every single month. Cool. So it's a great revenue stream for him. All right. Sounds good. I'll, I'd like to know more about it. Let's end this episode here. Yeah. Uh, how can people follow up with you? Yeah. So the best place is LinkedIn or Twitter. I don't use any other social media. So ideally Twitter is going to be the best, but then LinkedIn, if they have some business kind of um, injuries or something like that. Okay. So I'll put that in the show notes. It'll be on YouTube. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Urosh. I appreciate it. Uh, this has been a great conversation, very valuable. Hopefully people look into Webflow after they watch this. And if you have anyone that's interested in developing a website, definitely look at Webflow before going to WordPress uh, just blindly. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day and make sure you have a beautiful website so you can attract many great potential customers who make you and your team tons of money so you can pay to upskill them and everyone lives happily ever after. Thank you, Yorosh. Thank you, thank you so much for inviting me, Sin. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for staying with us until the end of this episode. We know that you'll like the other two that are on the screen now. The one on the top right is the episode that we think you would benefit from by listening to next the most. And the one beneath it is what YouTube believes is also a really good choice for you. So thanks again for sticking with us, and we hope to see you on the next video.